everybody. Hi, hi. Heidi and Tim from the city also. Awesome. They look all cozy. It looks like it's not too warm there, yeah. Heidi. No, it's not terribly warm, but it's pretty. You guys are real regular. Nikki, show her your arm. Oh, look, Heidi. What? Oh my God, Nikki. Look at her arm. Wow, me too. Yeah, Is Nikki. Yes. Yeah. Nikki had frozen shoulder, back. which is an affliction that... What's that? I can put it behind my back. That is oh, yeah, <laughs> I, I can't do it quite as high as the other one yet, uh, but it's getting there. Something that uh, afflicts women in uh, at a later part of the years, they get what's called frozen shoulder. And literally, it's painful constantly. Oh, it's Nikki, really hell. But what, six months? But it just, just goes away with time and some ther physical therapy. And... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let's see. It started. I don't know why in, it's mostly only women either. It's kind of funny. Started in July, I want to say, very beginning of July for me. Yeah, mine was March. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. No, it takes some time, but we're better. Yay! Yay. And uh, right, right there, Wilbur Woad uh, is a musician. I can tell somehow. Where are you calling in from, Wilbur? Hope you're you want to unmute? You want to unmute? All right. I'm from Lubeck, Maine. Oh, awesome. Where was that? Maine. Maine. Yeah. Wow. Out here in the wilderness. Okay. Wow. Well, if you want to play us some music today, um, looks like you're ready. And do you have much <laughs> snow up there? We're in the middle of a, a nor'easter right now. The southern part of the state's got about 30 inches, but we haven't got much at all, about four, I think, four or five inches. A lot of wind. Uh, 30 inches, whoa. <laughs> That's a lot. That's amazing. Swami. And Omar, it's great to see you. Well, Omar, oh, what is that? What is that, well, the Burning Man? <laughs> oh. oh. It's like the imaginary foundation shirt that somebody had left in my car a long time ago, and I washed it and adopted oh. it. <laughs> it's called smoking with Swami. And <laughs> That's right. I, I don't smoke paper, so I vape. So I took a stock from my white widow, and I whittled it out and made a pipe out of it, and uh, I'm going to smoke with Swami. That's outstanding. Okay, all right, we'll do that. I got, I got a Swami joint rolled. That's so cool you used a branch yeah, uh -huh. back there. That's very oh, cool. Oh, and Brian, Brian Riffle came on. Uh, hey, guys. Hi, Brian. How you doing? Sorry, I was driving What's home earlier, so behind? I kept you guys in the dark. <laughs> okay, well, where are you, Brian? I'm, uh, I'm north of St. Louis, about two hours in Missouri, uh, right by the river off of Hannibal, Missouri. Oh, yeah, I've been through there. I've been through there. Uh huh. Wow. That's uh, Tom Sawyer country. Yeah, that's, that's right. Pioneer that's started. right. <laughs> that is right. They all oh, yeah. And the Mark Twain uh, Dam. They're cannabis. And, and who did the painting behind you? Um, I would have to say that I can't remember. I was on a journey when I got that, and um, I was at a festival, and <laughs> okay. there was a lot of people hugging other people, and I got it as a gift, and it stayed with me for about three years now. So beautiful. Good for you. Yeah, it, it looks like it'll take you on a journey. While I'm looking into it. Yeah. It's that uh, yeah. racing Excellent. snail off of uh, I forget what that movie is, but there's a racing snail, and that's his face right there. And then like it goes back into that. Oh, okay. it's pretty. <laughs> I love that kind of stuff. I'm a very visual type of person. I love it. Heidi's jumping hey, the gun with her hey. joint there. She's a stoner from way back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Kyle, where are you calling from? Um, Swami, I'd like to ask you a question. This is Tim. Um, I, okay. I, I saw your video on uh, life and Swami, and uh, I, would, I was intrigued by your procedure of washing your plant. When you stuck it in a 50-gallon drum of water, and uh, yeah. you know, I've never ever seen anybody do it. I haven't seen it in any other culture in Mexico or Colombia or Thailand or whatever. This is the first year we've done it, yeah. Okay. Well, if yeah. I can answer that question, what happened is you might've read we had those forest fires all summer long here out in California. 
Right. And at one point, the fires were 15 miles to the southeast of us and 15 miles to the northeast of us. And uh, so we had a fair amount of smoke. But fortunately, that was kind of early on, uh, August and September. But we just felt that we wanted to wash the plants. We dipped them in, in very dilute hydrogen peroxide. Well, wait, let me just say one thing. When the fires happened, which you know, Tim, how thick that smoke was because you're in the city, yes. um, the ash was the problem. Yeah, it rained so ash. The, you know, the good news is, is up here, because it's um, forest fire smoke, it's not, uh, not like a city burning. It's not bad, you know, toxic stuff. So it's all this forest fire ash. We had, first thing we did was we took a leaf blower to the plants and kind of very gently blew off a lot of the ash. And then we felt just to be double precaution, and a lot of people did this this year. We actually, on harvest, what happens is, is you cut the plants, you bring it in, they're broken down into branches, and it, the branches were dipped first into a very light mix of water and hydrogen peroxide, and then into a pure 100% water bath, oh, and then hung up to dry. Yeah. And that's just to make double, double sure that yeah. there wasn't anything on there still from the ash that could contaminate the plants at all. And it seems to have worked quite yeah, well. Yeah. yeah. So it, we, uh, after about four or five uh, plants, we changed the water. And so uh, it, it was really just a cleansing process because if some of that stuff builds up, you can fail microbial testing. Uh, there are very stringent testing rules here in California. And so just as a precaution and the protection because you know, we feel really important about the medicine we put out that it's got to be as clean as we can make it. So we haven't felt any, uh, seen any uh, bad results so far. It doesn't smell like smoke. It doesn't taste like smoke and so on. So I think we kind of dodged the bullet. Yeah. So I want to say hello to Lauren. Nice to have you on the show Thank again, you. Lauren. And uh, yeah, we'll be, uh, <laughs> we'll be asking some Have questions. Hey. And we, just before we start, and there's Kyle. Uh, Posusta, and where are you from, Kyle? Can you put your mute off? Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute, Kyle. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Lebec, Le California. Where's that? That's the grapevine, uh, right? Uh, a little, a little south of Bakersfield, um, about seventy-five okay. miles north of LA. I stayed at oh, a okay. hotel in Lebec one time when I was on the road. Um, heading up from LA back home and it actually snowed that one night because you're kind of up high as you're going over the grapevine before, yeah. before you go back into the Central Valley and we woke up to snow outside the hotel rooms that was oh wow okay. okay wow can you actually grow around there is there any outdoor growing that happens looks Kyle? like he's making a joint right there uh yeah I'm, I'm making uh, it's good I'm, good I'm trying <laughs> okay. All right. Good luck. And then one last Corinna Strauss before we kind of get started here. We're getting on. Uh, hello, Corinna. I don't see your face, but welcome to uh, session with Swami. So, you. Where are you at, Corinna? I'm actually from Boonville, but I'm in Las Cruces, New Mexico for the winter. All oh, right. lucky, lucky woman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that sounds nice. Okay. That yeah. sounds great. And but James I'm already... Hirsch checking in from New York. Oh, that's right, there. Corinna. I'm originally from Katadi. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Katadi, okay. Oh, that's real local. Well, yeah, oh, Katadi, great place. That's really close to Omar and Lauren's office, actually, not far. Yeah, They're in Sebastopol. Sebastopol. Yeah. So that's the Sonoma County. And James, tell us about New York. You're in the middle of a giant snowstorm right now, aren't you? Oh, yeah, six inch giant. It's only about six, six inches. Inch. Okay. Six inches, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. We're I've in heard New York, other places you? about 30 and Long Island, North, North Shore of Long Island, Sea Cliff. Okay. Cool. My folks are yeah. in Jersey. Cool. Yeah. Uh -huh. I right, haven't right. even looked at the we weather. Talked about that, Lauren. Yeah. What part of Jersey, Lauren? They are in Ramsey, which is Bergen County, so not far from the city. Uh -huh. And then my sister actually lives yeah. in Manhattan right now. She's in her little apartment oh, in the middle of the city where I would not like to be, but she yeah. loves it. So we're very different. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. during COVID, that would be yeah. tough. I grew yeah, up in right. Morris County, just uh, right nearby where, where you are. So That's let's right. get started a little bit with introduction with, uh, with Omar, and then we'll go to Lauren. And Omar, uh, where did you grow up? And uh, Actually, Omar, I wonder now, are you back in Sebastopol? Are you still down south in some warmer climates? Or where are you no, at? I'm, I'm in Sebastopol. This is my actual oh, office. You're back. Yeah, not a virtual background. Okay. Uh -huh. That's yeah. what I recognize that. We've been there, yeah. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Well, that's great. So where did you grow up? Uh, you know, I was born in Mexico, so I grew up half in Mexico, Mexico City, which was like beautiful wooded area, lots of trees. I remember as a little boy, like uh, watching, you know, walking in the forest and like, you know, watching all the monarch butterflies come back on their yearly migration. And then um, when I was nine, we, my parents moved me to Southern California and we ended up uh, first in like Laguna Hills, but there was like not enough kids. So we ended up moving to Irvine. And then um, I went to the public schools in Irvine, which was complete culture shock after growing up in Mexico and being part of the dominant majority then being part of the minority in Irvine. And um, it was very eye opening, you know, I. Uh, was exposed to like the semi underside of the American dream growing up in the glitzy suburbia of Southern California. And so uh, for me, you know, it, it really informed, I guess, my position as an anti authoritarian lawyer because I just hated the little police state that we had in Irvine. We had like a Woodbridge Village Association. I lived in a plant community called Woodbridge and uh, they used to have like little security guards going around and giving people fines for like not like closing the garage door, not painting everything in the earth tone colors that were part of the approved color scheme. You know, really totalitarian oh, living. It's like a dystopic nightmare that, you know, I moved from like, you know, like very close family bonds to kind of like, you know, very affluent, but at the same time distant and estranged uh, society. And so growing up in uh, Irvine, I was subjected to the full war on drugs nonsense. And I was raised Catholic, so I believed all that. I was, you know, confirmed Catholic, altar boy, the whole deal. And then when I got to, um, when I got time to go to college, I was just so done. I, went, I picked the college that was the farthest away from me. And that was like Yale College, you know, and, and like I knew if I went there, my parents would never come visit me, you know, and I wouldn't have unexpected visitors. <laughs> and it, it was true. They didn't come until graduation, you know, so I went to Yale and um, it was like I was the first person in my, in my family to ever go to college. And that was like, you know, a trip. But it was such a, a difference from going to like from growing up in Irvine where, you know, I was kind of like a, in an intellectual desert and, you know, people like, um, you know, like, like people just did not like, you know, reading books and did not like engaging ideas and were not interested. They don't have that curiosity. You know, it was more about like being cool yeah. and being detached and being disengaged and not being engaged in the world. And so um, it was like a culture shock for me going to Yale. And, you know, I had been exposed to all this crazy drug war madness. So everybody at Yale drank like a fish and I did too. And, and I drank so much that I just, I just, I remember one day my junior year, like I was super hungover and I was just like, oh, this sucks and nothing would take care of it. And one of my friends, was smoking a joint, um, you know, for, and we were in the Branford College Courtyard, like Yale's divided into residential colleges that look like Harry Potter movie sets. And so I was like sitting in this college courtyard that looks like a Harry Potter movie set. And uh, I'm like, oh, this is brutal. It's like Sunday morning. And I'm like, just like, you know, puking and it's not doing anything for me. And so my friend like tosses down a joint and I'm like, oh, I, you know, I normally wouldn't like smoke marijuana, but I was just like, desperate and so I took a hit and then immediately it just like got rid of my hangover and I, then I took more hits and it felt pretty good and so after that I just stopped drinking like I did an about uh, face and then um, I, it was such a rapid transformation that by the time my senior year rolled around next year I had acquired the senior honorific like everybody gets a little honorific or you know like when they graduate uh, senior superlative and mine uh, was like most likely to open a bakery and that was <laughs> not a, a bread bakery but a cannabis bakery um, a place where people get baked <laughs> yeah. and um, 
So then I, I went off to. Uh, Pun intended. Well, you weren't skull and bones, probably. You? What is that? I was not in skull and bones. I was a, in a society, no, okay. you know, in, uh, I'll, I mean, I can tell you about it because like a, a lot of the secrets got ejected in the 60s. And so um, I was in a society called, I don't know if I can do share screen. Oh, maybe I could. Um, okay, maybe I, I'll try to show you a picture of it, but it was called Book and Snake Society. And the whole idea of secret societies yeah. is pretty cool. Um, where you basically have like a your little clubhouse and you know these clubhouses were founded in like the mid 1800s by all these rich white boys um and basically like the uh, society consists of 16 seniors and they're supposed to come from all like walks of life in campus you know so like for our our society like we had um you know some people who are like exceedingly good at like uh, rugby, but I have never met him. I've never, you know, kind of seen him around and, you know, but never really hung out with him. Or like, you know, people who are like into musical theater, which wasn't my thing. And they were just so busy doing musical theater that I never got to hang out with him. And so they're trying to pick like diverse uh, people. And then I'll tell you what the secret of the secret society is, is that there are no secrets. You know, like basically <laughs> what you do is like the first part of the year, is uh, you uh, give your own autobiography in excruciating detail, you know, from the, your first memory to the present, which is like a very helpful exercise because it helps people adopt kind of like this long range view of their life and you kind of get this overview effect of, you know, your whole life. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of the secret society process is trying to find the next people to tap. And so that just turns into a cluster, as you can imagine, because everybody wants to replicate their own, you know, themselves. Everybody <laughs> thinks that they are like the ultimate paragon of all these ideals and, you know, they want to choose their own clone and so then people can't agree and you know it just turns into a mess but you know that's basically the way I described TAP for secret societies actually was kind of the criticism of the MacArthur Genius Fellowship that it's survival of the mediocre because like the people who really were like really extreme like they were controversial and a lot of times th that would disqualify them for membership in a secret society because you you couldn't have any enemies in order to you know get into uh, like the, the most elite societies, you know, because otherwise, you know, you'd be too controversial. Um, my society yeah, kind of. Omar, we yeah. four twenty. So every oh, four twenty. That's gonna hurt. So we yeah. have a, a moment to. Uh, I started to interrupt your uh, your monologue no, there, no. Uh, but also <laughs> I, uh, let's light them up, and then I want to go to Laura and then, and talk to her. But wait, Omar, I do have a question. It's just kind of a silly question, but here you are, this little boy, and you get moved from. Mexico up to Southern California. Did you speak English already, or did you have no, to? No, I did on not. And... Complete immersion. Yeah. You know, I did not speak any English. And as a matter of fact, all my teachers in Mexico had taught me the wrong words. You know, like they're teaching me their half-assed, <laughs> mangled Spanglish that they knew, and so it was a complete disadvantage to have uh, English education in Mexico when I came to the U.S. Mm. Well, yeah. you overcame it. Uh, yeah, it was scary. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, no, but I think that's so incredible that you got into Yale that obviously they saw here's this kid that has no chance in Irvine to be who he can be, obviously has the talent to be. And, you know, kudos to Yale for finding you and accepting you. Yeah, I was like really lucky in retrospect, you know, like it's kind of like a, a lottery ticket that I didn't know I had won. And, uh, you know, I was very good at right. testing. And so I was lucky that I did well on my SATs and I got recruited by many schools, but I didn't get like scholarship offers. I had to like get financial aid and work and hustle when I got to college. Um, but I think that really like gave me a, a better perspective than all the rich kids who didn't have to work their way through college. Cause a lot of them, yeah. you know, like they were like talking of gap years after graduation before you decide whether or not to apply to <laughs> law school or med school or whatever, you know, I didn't have that luxury. Like for me, like law school was just a way to not have to work anymore and just to, you know, keep slacking. Right. And so um, that kind of explains my path, but I, I let Lauren, Lauren has a very wait, interesting wait. <laughs> way to, yeah. But, but Omar, I just want to say, Omar, one more thing. You could run for president. You know, a lot of the presidents have gone to Yale. So I'd vote for you. Born in Mexico. <laughs> I'm not eligible. Me and Ted Cruz. Yeah. Hey, hey everyone. <laughs> um, uh, <coughs> okay, so Laura, Lauren. Laura, now tell us about where you came from, New Jersey, and uh, lovely Lauren Mendelson. 
Let's hear your story. Oh, we got to unmute you, Lauren. What happened? You just muted yourself. He clicked the wrong button. Oh. And took the picture off. All right. Yeah. Well, my connection go. is unstable. So I'm trying to stabilize my internet connection. So I apologize if I cut out. Okay. But um, hi, everybody. Um, great to see you here. Happy 420. Um, thank you, uh, Swan and Nikki, for uh, inviting me to this sesh. Uh, and uh, it's really great to see you guys are beautiful people. I miss you. Um, I see a lot of other beautiful people on this call as well, some of whom I know, some of whom I don't. Um, so I'm glad to share this moment with you all. Um, I am very, uh, my name is Lauren Mendelson, and I have the um, privilege and honor of being uh, Omar's senior associate attorney at, at uh, his law firm here in Sonoma County, California. And um, I have been working with Omar since right around when Prop 64 passed. I actually started working for him within a few weeks of uh, the Prop 64 vote. And I was actually, I was fresh, pretty much fresh out of law school at that point as well. Um, so I can say that I've been doing cannabis law for my whole career, which is <laughs> not a lot of lawyers can say that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's really been awesome to, uh, to work with Omar during this period of time and to be in this cannabis space during this really uh, transitional and, and formative period of time from the legacy uh, medical cannabis and collective model that was here in California for, for decades, you know, since uh, in the 90s, starting with Prop 215 and, and being able to transition over into this more commercialized industry um, without losing the heart of, of what makes the cannabis uh, community special. And I think that's something that one of the reasons I really love working with Omar um, is, uh, is because he really cares about um, people. He cares about the plants. He cares about freedom and justice. And I care about these things as well. And so um, that is always, you know, overlaid onto whatever we're doing at, at the law firm. So, um, you know, I guess a little bit about me. Um, I grew up on the East Coast, um, grew up in uh, New York State and then New Jersey. Um, my family is all still back there. And I went to college at the University of Maryland College Park right near DC. Um, and uh, I, you know, I grew up thinking I wanted to be a doctor. And then I was in, uh, in college and I started getting really involved with Students for Sensible Drug Policy, SSDP. So you might have heard of that group, really great group of uh, young people working to, to change the war on drugs. And um, I didn't, I really grew up in a bubble and I didn't know much about um, the drug war or about, um, you know, mass incarceration or about the pharmaceutical industry or really things of, of politics and policy works until I got MP and I really uh -oh. Uh -oh. I started you know, writing for the pay track to a, to a uh, pre-law track and I decided that I wanted to um, go to law school and, and get a law degree so that I could continue, um, you know, kind of incorporating activism and policy work into my day-to-day -day job, um, which seemed hard to do as a doctor, but certainly, you know, easier to do as a lawyer because lawyers are advocates and that's really what I like doing. Um, so right. anyway, you know, I, uh, I, I, after uh, College Park, um, and that's also where I first really got involved in the cannabis community, like not just involved in the activism side, but also, you know, I didn't really start like smoking weed too much until I was in college. I, I think I tried it a few times my senior year of high school, but it wasn't really, um, it was in college that I found my, um, you know, my, my group of friends that was into the, um, the counterculture, so to speak. And, and they're really um, the most beautiful and welcoming people that I had, I had met uh, were these folks that were um, consuming plants that us, you know, were, might've been illegal. And so that's really starting, you know, the way they are. We Mm -hmm. uh, so you're cutting out a little bit there. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. Uh, you are. Or you're right. You have an unstable here. connection. Times change the, uh, how about how about now? That's better. Yeah, better now, yeah. Okay. You're back. I'm back. Okay. Um. Well, let's see. So uh, after that, um, 
went to law school at UC Irvine. So uh, I actually also lived in Irvine, like Omar, but at a different point in, in time. And so I'm familiar with that, uh, that uh, kind of what Omar's talking about. Everything looks the same there. And it's kind of, um, you know, you think it's nice in the, in the beginning, but then you're like, oh, this is creepy. Like, yeah, no one talks to each other. It's very sterile. It's, um, it's the kind of reminds you like the Stepford Wise, if you guys have, have seen that movie to kind of, <laughs> that sense. So um, anyway, it was a good place to go to law school because there was nothing to do. There were no distractions. It was boring and safe. So in that sense, it was not, probably would have been terrible for college undergrad, um, but for law school, it was, it was good. And, um, you know, that was really, um, you know, I had a great time. UC Irvine Law School, um, if you don't know about it, it's a really, really, really cool place. It just started. I was the fifth graduating class. I was the first year that it was even accredited. Um, and it was started to be a law school for the 21st century that's focused uh, less on just, you know, the, the theory and the academics and more on the practical side of things and also on public service. Everyone was required to do pro bono. Everyone was required to do clinics. Um, and essentially half of the faculty used to work for the ACLU or all these other super righteous things. And uh, Erwin Chemerinsky was the dean while I was there and he kind of handpicked a lot of these faculty members. Um, and so, and all the classmates, because the school wasn't accredited or ranked yet, it was in everyone's best interest that we all did really well. And so I hear these stories usually at law school, everyone competing with one another, tearing out pages in the library, trying to sabotage one another. Um, it was the complete opposite. We were having group study sessions and we had shared Google Docs and, you know, we all wanted each other to all, get, you know, do well. And um, so it was a very different you know, a, a great family, um, community atmosphere, very progressive. Uh, I really, really enjoyed that. I think I would have hated just about any other law school. Um, and uh, so that was great. And I did get a scholarship there, almost a full scholarship, which was amazing. They were giving a lot of scholarships to and folks to come to this new school that no one had heard about, all taking a risk essentially to go to a place that wasn't even, you know, accredited when I started going there. Um, so anyway, um, that was how I got to California. And it was then, um, you know, when I was in law school, I started clerking for a local law firm that was doing, they wanted to start a cannabis um, uh, division of this, you know, mid-sized corporate law firm. And someone found me on LinkedIn <laughs> because I was, said I was involved with like SSDP. And so I essentially, work like you can't actually just randomly someone will reach out to you on LinkedIn for this opportunity and um, I ended up uh, meeting with them um, and uh, it resulted in me getting brought on as an intern helping them of this firm um, that was a cool experience and that was really opened my eyes to doing transactional work preview might either do uh, criminal just criminal defense or policy because coming from the east coast there was no cannabis industry yet there wasn't you know that wasn't a thing there weren't contracts or licenses yet there but it was starting to be a thing here of um and so anyway um you don't need my whole life story but after um you know i started working for um omar after law school um and you know it's really been an amazing experience like i said right around when prop 64 happened um really do at our firm and expanding what we're doing to meet the needs of the industry that's growing and changing. Um, and it's just been really great. Um, and I guess that's it. You guys can ask me more questions, but that's, okay. that's the just overall to, for, story. For and, um, um, we've been working with Omar yeah. and Lauren for the last couple of years. Uh, they've been helping us in all sorts of ways. Uh, I mean, Lauren, it's like, she's what you call sharp as a tack and just brilliant and just totally on top of it. And Omar, of course, is a kind of legendary figure. Uh, just one second, did you, did you used to work with Tony Serra in that office? How were you connected with that? Sure, I worked for 12 years at Pier 5 Law Offices. So I was kind of the resident marijuana expert because 
like all the other lawyers, like, you know, they would take all every kind of case and usually the murder cases were the highest paying. Um, but I didn't like murder cases because I didn't want to spend my day thinking about blood spatter patterns and, you know, like just all these like gruesome <laughs> details of homicides. And but I really did love the cannabis cases. And I started noticing that the facts kept repeating, like the cops like only had like seven different versions of possible facts that they could deal with. And so over time, you could just debunk all their bullshit and it became very fun. And then I also had my own traveling show. I would, it was like my road show traveling around the state um, with like these unique motions I had developed that were specific to medical marijuana cases that most of the judges had never seen before. And so like for the prosecutors, since they're using usually I uh, used to doing everything with uh, something called like their auto file like they have like auto automatic brief writings and you know for like uh, legal issues that they've already kind of like have like a, a, a stock brief for that particular issue but for medical marijuana it was changing so quickly that they didn't have that capability so you would come in with the latest cases and then it would just short circuit the system and it was super fun and so I started at Pier 5 uh, originally as a volunteer on the Bear Lincoln case at, straight out of law school like I met Tony at Stanford when I was at, in law school and uh, we became friends because like he came to give a speech at Stanford Law School and um, about halfway through the speech, you know, um, Tony's like just getting like fidgety. And so like me and my friends were also getting fidgety. We're like, we got to go get high. And so like, <laughs> you know, um, so Tony starts getting fidgety and then like, you know, he ends his speech and we can cut where everybody wants to get high, you know, like uh, at least the people who like to get high. Um, and that, that was like basically about 10% of us in the room. But, um, you know, one of my friends asked Tony a question. It's like, do you ever get high after 7 p.m.? And, and Tony looked at the clock and he's like, oh, it's 7.30. Yes, I do. And so then we said, oh, well, will you come with us? And so we went to the law school dorm called Crothers Hall, which has since been demolished. But um, we went to Crothers Hall uh, with Tony, Sarah, and, you know, he had like a, a little entourage of students following him. But once we started breaking out the key from the bud and smoking bong hits and, you know, all that, Tony was like, you know, fish swimming in water. But all the other law students, like most of them, I had like, you know, a few friends um, who were like the dedicated stoners. And there's usually like two or three in every class at Stanford Law School. Um, and so all the dedicated stoners, you know, came into the room and we just had like legendary like two hour session with Tony Sarah. And so, and Tony Sarah also had the green bud. Cause like, I, you know, I came from the East coast where like our bud was like all this brick weed, you know, the good stuff was like all compressed and you had to like pick apart the stems and rip that apart from like the, you know. That's the old Mex, we used to get that too. Yeah, the old Mexican weed. Yeah. Wow, and so Tony. So Tony had the green bud. And so we're like, wow, Tony, this is amazing. Like, where can we get more of this? And he's like, well, you can't get it for me, but you know, you can talk to my client. And so we ended up becoming the client's client, um, me and my law school friends. And then, you know, after that, we like would call Tony just to schedule like a yearly visit because he was so entertaining. And, and basically like, you know, he ended up conscripting us to a lot of a, lo a lot of events. He's like, "Oh well, I'm gonna I gotta go speak at Lincoln High School to all these you know disadvantaged kids. You guys go with me." And we're like, "Okay." <laughs> Maybe we thought we were gonna be getting high the whole time. You know, we thought it, was, it would be an adventure. But Tony's like very disciplined. He wouldn't get high until like he was done for the day at 4 p.m. And so um, we you know, he, he so like he went that. to He'd Lincoln. Bring more people along. Yeah, He'd always bring people along. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I first met probably in uh, 1969 or something like that. Uh, I was tripping on an acid trip. It was about 4 a.m. And we went to this little hole in the wall. And he just showed up there and I showed up there. And we kind of been uh, friends ever since then. It was just one of those things because he his office was right in North Beach at that time. Right. That's right. Oh, so, yeah. And then. Uh, yeah. No. So Omar, I've, I've got a question actually for both of you. So. This amazing book that you put out. I don't oh, know yeah. if you've all ever seen this book that Omar does. He's really the ultimate authority on cannabis law, but he has to update this every year. Are you working on the 2021 now? 
Yes, that revision is currently underway and we're kind of waiting for, you know, the finalization yeah. of all these regs. There's like the OCAL regulations for like right. the comparable to organic program and then the Appalachian regulations. Right. So we're waiting for all those right. to be final. So like the book can have like, you know, kind of the, the snapshot of the law. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the book, like when I, for me, like the first book was really like my own booby prize after to myself after prop 64 passed because i figured like i don't really want it to pass kind of like i wanted it to pass because it would make all my cases a lot easier but also i i didn't like a lot of the provisions and i had written a competing initiative the craft cannabis initiative which you know didn't really like me endear me to prop 64 because i thought my competing initiative was way better and it was all geared towards like allowing craft cultivators you know direct consumer access and um, you know streamlined regulation all these like dreams that sound like pipe dreams these days <laughs> but anyway um so but i thought like if as you know like before prop 64 passed like we were working on the book like we were working on a compilation of all the laws uh, just because we thought there was going to be an explosion and by by we, I would say it was like me and then Tina Smith, who's like a resident of Mendocino County and, you know, is has been working with, uh, with me on the book, you know, from the from the beginning. Um, she's like a, a recent graduate of um, what is it called, like Empire College of Law. And uh, she yeah. really knows like, you know, cannabis and uh you know, she's one of my first clients, like many, many moons ago, you know, and so she's a, she's a wonderful person. And, you know, I, I give her the credit, you know, for helping me but compile. Like big changes this yeah. That I imagine you're going to have to cover is the, this com combination of the three of the BCC, the CDFA and oh, the yeah. DPH, right? Which people don't know, that means the California Department of Food and Agriculture the um, BCC, which is the Bureau of Cannabis Control, and DPH, which is Department of Public Health. And so all of these, each one of these groups covers different parts of the can legal cannabis world. But they're thinking of now actually coming together, which we hope will make life easier. Oh, absolutely. What do you think? I think so. Look, my book is like right now 600 plus pages, you know, because there's three sets yeah. of regulations and many of them are duplicative. So if unification comes in, they're gonna like, uh, it's gonna be a complicated process because first they have to rewrite the laws and then they have to rewrite regulations. But, and so we're gonna go through oh. all that all over again, <laughs> but, but yeah. the book will become much thinner again. And that's a good thing, I think. I don't like having a 600 page book and uh, I'm always like keeping track of the legal changes because like I have to, the responsibility of keeping the book up and, you know, like even, the, um, and I work with Tina on like, you know, making sure that the book is gonna be comprehensive and have everything in it. And, you know, so uh, from the, the perspective of watching all these laws change, I really do think unification will be good in the long run. It, you know, the devil's always in the details. Like what I'm like, what I would love to see in terms of like changes would be direct consumer access to cultivators. And there was something that there was a bill that gave like temporary retail permits at cannabis events for any cultivators and manufacturers. Yeah. Basically, the olden days of the Emerald Cup, where like all the growers and manufacturers could meet together, meet all the consumers, and you know form one-to-one -one, uh, relationships while they're all consuming together and appreciating the cannabis and its you know multitudinous glory. Uh, so I would like to see that again. And uh, with the California Cannabis Tourism Association, I'm on the board of that industry organization we're trying to push for like you know changes that allow for more cannabis tourism opportunities but for me the most important thing is giving mm -hmm. cultivators such as yourself direct access to consumers yeah, yeah we got word wow. that the so, consolidation is it's gonna happen um it's on track to happen this year we've heard from some inside sources so it's um it's you know, we should be getting ready to start actually seeing those probably in the next few months, right? You know, some some proposals, maybe it was this summertime, but we're going to essentially by this time next year, we're going to at least have draft, if not the the final consolidated regulations is my understanding. Yeah, my um, understanding is... So 
there's gonna be a new regulatory framework, right? Like by July, mm -hmm. it's all gonna be part a new of the agency. budget. Yeah, and there's the new agency, the Department of Cannabis Control, and then it's gonna take under its wing like all of these like little units that are currently scattered across the California bureaucracy. So it's gonna um, have enforcement under the uh, Department of Cannabis Control, as well as like the components from like the Department of Food and Agriculture, as well as Department of Public Health, uh, will all be under one roof. And then the regulatory rulemaking, where they come up with the regulations, is going to be weird because they're just going to issue emergency regulations, kind of like what they did last time. So we'll be operating under emergency regulations under this streamlined, unified regime. And Basically, there's a chessboard and people have been playing on the chessboard and now they're saying we're knocking over the chessboard and we're going to like try to start again. And I think that's, you know, it's better to have a, a less cumbersome Byzantine chessboard, but at the same time for people who've spent so much time and energy and they're about to win, that's not fair. And so, you know, yeah. No, I, I, one thing that complicates it also, Tony, is the CEQA stuff. Tony, I mean, I'm, Tony, yeah, Omar, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's the, the CEQA, you know, the California Environment and Quality Act. And from what, my, what I've been told is that two thirds to three quarters of all kinds of uh, licenses are only provisional. Yep. And so if like all licenses issued for the whole state of California for whether it's retail, distributor, testing, ma manufacturer or cultivation, all of them or three quarters of them are only provisional. And if they don't pass the CEQA, they will be out of business. How does that intermesh with this new transfer? Well, Lauren and I were talking <laughs> about this huge problem that many cultivators in Mendocino County are facing, which is that, you know, their ordinance was a ministerial permit and it's creating all sorts of issues in trying to get an annual license. Um, but it seems, that, um, and Lauren can maybe elaborate, that there's going to be a legislative proposal uh, to help deal with that by extending the uh, deadline mm -hmm. for these um, you know, temporary or I guess not provisional licenses. There's no more temps. These are called provisions. Right, right. which isn't a full right. fix, but it's at least a bigger band-aid to give some more time right. to figure things out. Um, Cause that, you know, to see if, can, can there be a solution? Can there, I, I believe there actually need to be some changes to the CEQA, uh, the underlying CEQA law itself um, and how, how cannabis programs uh, projects rather are, are analyzed overall. Um, and so mm -hmm. I think that it'll give folks more time to either literally change the state law in that regard or to at least complete if they have to do CEQA analysis on their own, um, give them more time to complete that. Um, and so right. I, I'm, I, I think, um, I think it would be a shame to, and I do not think the state would just let all these people down at, at this point in time. I think the state has to act. And I know that they would there deprive are themselves of, of revenue yeah, if they were to do that. Exactly. Yeah. And there's a number of folks that are, that are advocating to them about this um, and they're aware of it. And so, but it is, um, it has been interesting just to watch, um, you know, to watch approaches that different jurisdictions even within the state of California are taking. I mean, something that's been really interesting during this whole process is the idea of the concept of local control has led to just really different, um, you know, permitting processes and experiences uh, across the same state. And so we work with clients throughout the state in different license types. And it's just so interesting to compare and contrast the way, the way you get permitted, uh, what the requirements are, what the fees are, what folks' experiences are like, you know, the, the types of folks who are running the local governments, you know, the kind of shady stuff that's going on here versus there. Um, it's, it, it has just been really interesting because California is, is such a big state. And, um, you know, I'm sure this is uh, not just unique to California, but um, something that, you know, because there's all these different layers um, of regulation, um, it's just been really interesting and, and it's complex. And that's why I think the book is great um, that Omar has put together. I think there is, um, you know, certainly, um, are we, are we going to do a digital version of that, Omar? Is that the plan at some point? Try no, to it's, get it's like already a, there. You, have it's, a you can get it on iBooks. The Kindle, you can, there's a Kindle version and, Apple you know. books. I put the link on the chat window so if you guys are looking for where you can get the book um you can oh, yeah. click that link 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've got a question. I got a couple of questions, but the first one is, um, I'm just curious, what would you say is the most liberal progressive county in California? Because maybe we want to move there. <laughs> no, I'm just joking about that. But I am curious to know, what, what is the most liberal? Well, I think some of them are closing the doors, you know, like I would say, looking at like out maybe Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, like Monterey, like they were just like so friendly towards cannabis cultivation as, as compared to yeah. other jurisdictions like Sonoma County. Uh, I think Humboldt actually right. ended up doing an excellent job in managing, you know, the okay. issue and, and um, you know, Humboldt has a lot of like annual licenses, you know, hundreds of cultivators that are... Yeah you know, lawful. And, uh, you know, it was a very different approach um, at the county level, like the county leaders, like kind of saw this, that was their chance. And then they were very proactive. In Mendocino County, we all were part of the mm -hmm. citizen initiative measure AF, sure. that if that there had passed, it would have been incredible. You That's know, what like, I know. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. So, yeah. I know. It drives us crazy. So my other, um, Heidi had a question out there that's appropriate here. Will there be legalization to put cannabis cultivation under the farm regulations? So I guess that's also kind of asking whether it would become yeah. a, a, cult, a crop, actually. That's the key issue. That if we get that, then everything's figured out. And, yeah. you know, the, the state has to do it, but the feds do it. And then, you know, the UN. So it's a, it's a domino effect. You know? So do you think we have a chance? Um, definitely. And I think once cannabis is federally legal, there will no longer be any yes. excuse for treating cannabis any differently than, say, hemp or any other crop. And so federal legalization, right. you know, the sentiment now is that it's there's a strong everything rides on Georgia. We'll see what happens with that Senate runoff. And, you know, th that could change everything. There's also like some talk that Mitch McConnell is not really the president of the Senate. Kamala Harris will be the president and she could change like the customs because no, there's nothing in, in writing that requires Mitch McConnell to obstruct all legislation that hits the Senate. And, you know, maybe uh, Kamala Harris can say, you know, I'm the president of the Senate and here's the new rules and bypass Mitch McConnell that way. Um, if they're the, the cleanest way would be for there to be like a democratic majority in the senate and then i think the more act in a more um, evolved version would probably pass and what that would do would actually be amazing like the first thing it would do is it would de-schedule de and decriminalize marijuana retroactively so everybody who's doing time on a federal cannabis offense would be getting out and you know it, it would put out like expungement and criminal justice reforms. And so that part of it would be awesome that you no longer have to fear the feds. And right now, nobody fears the feds who, you know, nobody who's in strict compliance with state law. Um, but just like not having the feds be a factor and having a possibility of interstate commerce, which would happen with the MORE Act, uh, that would be awesome. You know, there's also some like major defects in the latest amendments to the MORE Act, which would disqualify from getting a producer's license, anybody who had legal proceedings involving cannabis ever, which is ridiculous. And, you know, that was put in, um, as we learned from uh, Congressman Blumenauer's office that was put in, you know, by somebody who was just cut and pasting the tobacco language and then just putting cannabis instead of tobacco and they're just adding these crazy disqualifying uh, provisions that will be amended, you know, in the new Congress. But um, there is a chance that we have federal, I mean, like, look, there's so many possibilities. So like, let's look at like one of the best possible worlds out there, you know, uh, and that would be that we have federal legalization, however that gets accomplished in the United States, and there's interstate commerce within California, that the United States joins the community of nations and signs the Lisbon Agreement for the protection of Appalachians of origin and, you know, th these, um, <clears throat> you know, and then that would allow all the cannabis Appalachians for like full sun outdoor cultivated cannabis, like the type that Nikki and Swami grow, that would be now um, recognized at the world level as a protected appellation. And it would no longer be forbidden under federal law. There's already talks in the MORE Act of having cannabis export warehouse licenses. So that, you know, exporting cannabis is seen as part of like 
the MORE Act. And so if something like that were to happen, you know, like we could see an incredible revolution in how cannabis, you know, the cannabis industry um, operates. Um, because I know there's people all across mm -hmm. the world who are just yearning for the craft cannabis that many of these artisan cultivators with rare genetics, and they've been stewarding these genetics over the you know, decades, um, you know, that hasn't been out there. Uh, what we're seeing is like lots of like mass produced booth weed and, you know, these, you know, um, I don't know, like supermarket type or, you know, like mass mass market type dispensaries. But um, I think the cannabis industry has like so much more promise. And, you know, a lot of that is having the traditional market uh, go into the light in a way that allows that all those incredible, you know, knowledge and genetics and skills um, to like come into the market. Cause there's so many more innovations that are kind of just waiting, you know, to be brought in. Like if you look at, if you go to a dispensary and you look at the products and you compare that with what your imagination is capable of conjuring, there's a big gulf. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Well, we're all praying for that day to happen and um... Hopefully 2021 yeah. is going to be a great year and we're going to see a lot of that progress. Yeah. <clears throat> well, see, it's such a complex thing because there's all these moving parts, these different agencies, there's the county, there's the feds, and then there's also even the little towns, as Lauren was talking about, they all get to have their little play in the game. And right. then, you know, it has to do with Appalachian, it has to do with environmental, it has to do with finance, it has to do with taxes, all these different things. And there's so many moving parts in this. But it could be super simple if there were some leadership that just says, hey, let's just stop all this crap and let it be. It really comes down to agriculture. And uh, we really have to move for that. And we, and we can start that at a ground level because I understand either Santa Cruz County, they declared it an agricultural uh, crop. And now Mendocino has a thing they want to call it an agricultural activity or endeavor or something like that. What are the chances of those things working? <laughs> At the local level, they would work very well. At the state level, we need some state legislation that would, you know, redefine how cannabis gets treated and maybe even change. I mean, I think, you know, CEQA does not apply to agricultural projects, you know, but, but it does apply to cannabis. And uh, that's because of its classification as an agricultural product and not an agricultural crop. And so I think that if, uh, some redefinitions could result in cannabis just being treated like every other crop, because that's what it takes to outcompete the traditional market is just allow people to, you know, uh, use their free enterprise and, you know, the, the um, free market to basically outcompete. But that's why we don't see a lot of like, um, you know, traditional market tobacco products or traditional market beer or traditional market, you know, like alcoholic products or wine. I frankly, you know, I've been given wines and you know, that I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to drink that. Cause I know I can get like wine that I know what's in it. I've been given like vodka that I don't know that are homemade that I'm not sure if I want to drink that. Cause I'd prefer to drink something that I know will not make me blind. And um, you know, I think that's um, <laughs> something that, that <laughs> that um, you yeah. know, we're going to see more so, and more. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, yeah, yeah, the traditional market is still the majority of it. And we're, we're for those of you, we're using this word traditional to get away from that other word, uh, the black uh, market word, and also, you know, even illicit, because there was something about that traditional market that even though it was persecuted and ever, so many people went to jail, it sort of lived outside the law, you know, like that Dylan song. There was a certain ethic within the community that did, did it sort of policed itself. That's so, what attracted um, me to being, one, a, yeah, to being a cannabis lawyer was, was that, you know, outlaw ethic, which is very honorable, like, you know, because there were no enforceable contracts, like people like really trusted each other and spent a lot of time together before they entered into these you know, big transactions where people's freedom yeah. was at stake. And so it ended up creating like this really honorable culture that for me as a lawyer was awesome. Like I knew that my cannabis cultivation clients, I would give them homework and they would do it. They would promise to pay me and they would, and they would usually like come through, you know, and if they were cocaine clients, no way you got to get paid up front because they'll never pay you, you know, tweakers, forget <laughs> it. Uh -huh. 
<laughs> well, you know, I make this analysis of the uh, traditional community is that, you know, there were, uh, there were no bank accounts, right? There were no stores, there was no advertising, there were no Coca-Cola trucks or uh, Budweiser trucks delivering it all across the country, you know? And, you know, you, there was no credit, there was no advertising no board of directors, anything. And yet somehow cannabis was so widespread, every high school had it, you know? That's and right. so there was something about how did that happen, right? And the fact was that it was like literally tens of thousands of people randomly connecting and knowing and trusting, like you said, that you had the trust, you know, half, you know, half a million dollar deals done on a handshake and, and people came through. Mm -hmm. And so there was this some weird, it was this, it was a very magic thing in a certain way. And uh, we, uh, that's what we're hoping not to lose ultimately. And then so we have to kind of keep our, our heart and soul together on this thing. And uh, but I, now before we, before we sign up, we're going to go, uh, well, we got another 20 minutes, a half hour or so, but yes. I want to ask both of you, Lauren, and, and if there's one thing that we could do in California that we could push us forward. And maybe that's a ridiculous question because of the complexity that I just mentioned, but is there something we can get done that's gonna actually help the farmers and the retailers and so on? I mean, for me, you know, if you could have, you know, two times a year, a temporary retail permit that allows you to sell direct to consumers and, yes. you know, that, that would be fantastic, you know? And, um, you know, that's what these temporary cannabis events uh, would allow. But now because of COVID, we don't really see that as like feasible for the short term. And so I think rather than have temporary cannabis events, it's just allow like temporary retail at, at uh, the, the manufacturer or cultivator's location, um, you know, with local permission, because the locals always want to have their little veto power. Uh, but I think that would be pretty awesome. Like if, you know, the United Cannabis Business Association had opposed a previous effort that would have given that power up to 12 times a year for cultivators. And they said, that's way too much. And our consumers will stop shopping at the dispensaries if, they, you know, they can go to like 12 cannabis events a year because that's like, you know, three a quarter and, you know, they can stock up and, you know, for their yearly needs. But something like that, I think would be pretty awesome. Just like, you know, direct consumer access. Um, something else, I guess, would be, you know, just to allow people to sell marijuana in small quantities tax-free without any hassle. You know, like if you could sell like, I don't know, 500 bucks worth of weed tax-free, you know, and it ha it's happening in California. Like, you know, why don't you just like make it legal? It's better to have the law comport to the way people act so that people will habitually obey the law as opposed to like having laws that are so out of sync with the way humans, um, you know, will act that, that they will disobey the law. It's not like my insight, it's uh, what I think uh, Clarence Darrow said of prohibition, you know, that having these ridiculous sumptuary laws that forbid human desire um, really like, you know, breed disrespect for the law. Mm -hmm. That's so, so true. Yeah, that's <clears throat> very true. Okay. Yeah. And, and Lauren, I, I what, is, what is your point. one thing? I, what's your thing? I, ta I think taxes overall, I think a combination, there needs to be a, a reduction, well, a couple things. I think the taxes um, need to be lower, the state taxes need to be lower, county and, and local taxes need to be lower. The combination of all of these taxes um, is, it's overly burdensome on the operators and usually that falls mostly on the cultivators they get the you know the heaviest of the tax burdens um it's also really burdensome on the consumers um and it's making it hard for this for over still get cannabis for so much out of these taxes you know you really gotta want that you know, tested products uh, in order to, to pay for this um, right now. And so I think that's 
definitely something that could help. And now if, if the MORE Act passes, there's federal taxes that, or whether it's the MORE Act or some other version of federal legalization, you got to bet the federal government wants their share of taxes as well. And so that's yet another layer of taxes. Um, so I think that that, yeah. you know, that needs to be looked at. Um, I think there needs to be more opportunities for tax breaks uh, for various types of companies and different types of compassion programs. Um, and I would like to see, um, I, I would like to see California California has a, a, a statewide equity program. Essentially, there's grant money. Part of the tax, cannabis tax goes towards um, grants for these uh, equity programs um, designed to help people who are most uh, negatively impacted by the war on drugs 60, in the cannabis industry. And um, so there's this grant money available from the state, but you don't actually apply for it as an operator. Your local jurisdiction has to adopt a local equity program, and then the, the jurisdiction applies from the grant from the state, and then the jurisdiction gets to give that money out. And I think that's a weird way that the state set it up. And I, uh, I would love to see you be able to access these resources if you live in a place that doesn't have an equity program, right? There's people that might qualify for that, but just because your city or county didn't do this doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to access that. So that's something that I'd like to see. Um, and I would also like to see more programs overall designed at helping small businesses, maybe not necessarily people that would qualify as a quote unquote equity business, but who are still a, uh, a small business, a legacy business, mom and pop, um, be able to compete against these bigger multi-state, um, multinational corporations that are involved. Um, and so that would just be great if, if there was, you know, to see if there was more investment from the state uh, in those types of, of programs. Um, I think that would be really helpful. And um, I'm, there's, I'm sure I can think of more, but. So if, do you predict that, um... When it becomes federally legal, because I trust it will soon enough. Um, I mean, is that going to bring in even more big corporations, actually, though? Don't you think that then they'll all feel like, yeah, we can get in even more? That's a good point. You know, what's keeping all these big pharma, big tobacco, and big alcohol companies out is federal prohibition. And so when right. that barrier is out, a lot of them will probably come in and blow their... Uh, investment dollars and all these like flashy, you know, we've seen it before. We're going to see yeah. it again. There's going to be like an, another, you know, like boom and bust. And um, so I, I guess like prepare to surf the wave, you know, like the, the advice to the wise is like, you know, imagine, I think with federal legalization, there's going to be like um, all of these like companies that really want to um, start buying up brands. And so those who have been sagacious enough to build up brands ahead of time, I think will be in a great position, such as you, Swami and Nikki. You've been very wise. Oh, yeah, we want Coca-Cola to buy. <laughs> oh, we don't want Coca-Cola. That's not true. <laughs> what about Ben and Jerry's? Wait, 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 wait. But if Coca-Cola would put Coke back in their Coke, Coca-Cola, <laughs> then it might be a deal. I don't know. <laughs> oh, I didn't say that either. I didn't, I didn't say that either. No, I'm just, My mom just used to tell me about that. I've never tried that before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, does anyone have any questions now for our, our uh, wonderful guests who are really quite uh, perspicacious on, on the law and so on? Uh, so if you want to have a question, wave your hand and then unmute yourself and so on. And uh, is there anything more in the chat? Nikki, no that, questions right now. Yeah. OK, no questions. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, I have another oh, point. Heidi. Heidi. Yeah. <laughs> I have yeah. Let's talk about Mexico for a second, albeit it's not California. They are going through quite a, an interesting transition in their federal legalization process. And um, I'm just curious to get your thoughts about Mexico, even though I know you're not a lawyer practicing in Mexico, either of you. Um, well, you know, it's funny because as members of this International Cannabis Bar Association, uh, Lauren is on the board of directors and I'm a you know, board member emeritus, um, we met lawyers from all across the world. So we had lawyers in Mexico reach out to us. And I've been in contact with lawyers in Mexico City who um, are practicing cannabis law. Right now, there's 
medical cannabis in Mexico. And it's basically like low THC, high CBD, you know, uh, stuff, but there's going to be within 18 months is what was confided to me, uh, would be probably like a realistic, uh, expectation for there to be full adult legalization in Mexico. And so at that point, I think Mm. there's going to be, um, you know, it's going to make Mexico more appealing. It's a vacation destination. I can tell you that. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. And I wonder what that'll do to affect um, anything coming across the border at that point. Interesting. I mean, you know, if it's been really hard for the cartels to compete with the quality that we have here. You know, it's like trying to ship coals to Newcastle. It's just not quite the best idea. <laughs> but and so I think the distribution networks have targeted Texas and other states. And I think that's what would impact the cartels the most would be when Texas goes legal. Um, but as far, so, you know, it's not really going to do away with the traditional market in Mexico, you know, having like a, a legal regime. And I think there's going to be a lot of corruption where the cartels have the money to make the payoffs and pay the mordidas, you know, like in Mexico, there's an expediter based system, like in San Francisco, where you basically have to like pay people off in order to get your project approved. And I'm not saying um, that in San Francisco, you know, you have to pay people off, but you do have to usually pay an expediter to move things along. And um, so, you know, I I think there's a huge potential for corruption. And, you know, that's the part I don't like about, you know, having some like regulated regime in a country like Mexico, where you'll see all of the inequalities that we see in California, like super magnified. And, you know, they'll start like targeting the, the people without licenses and trying to put them in jail so that those who are wealthy enough and well connected enough to you know grab a monopoly and the licenses are able to try to you know squeeze everybody else and so that to me is you know mexico is like an example of like dysfunctional late stage capitalism and actually like you know my thoughts on mexico are that the us is becoming more like mexico that my parents escaped um and it's becoming more of an oligarchy where you know there's in mexico it's said that there's like a thousand families that control the whole country and that own a lot of it and you know our misconception in the United States is that Mexico is a barren desert and a poor country is, you know, completely wrong. Mexico is a wealthy country, rich in mineral resources and, you know, like rich in many things, but it also has like just like complete exploitation and, you know, uh, many income inequalities. And that's why you see so many Mexicans in California, because people are are looking for uh, a life where they can compete on their own merits. And, you know, the rich people in Mexico don't leave Mexico because like life is very comfortable for them there. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, I can imagine. Okay. Wow. That's My family came up from Kuala. Mm such a curious time coming up, you know, the changes that are going to happen. And do, do you see that, um, you know, either of you, are there, are there many people getting busted these days? Mm, there's like a small uptick, you know, like I've, I've heard, you know, but not many people. Like I basically stopped practicing criminal defense, you know, other than activist defense for a while because wow. there were no, like cases that really were worth like the effort. People are not willing to pay, you know, a lawyer on a misdemeanor charge. And that was the main effect of Prop 64. And that's why I was a supporter of Prop 64 well, because I figured- the country. Huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. For the yeah, rest of the country though, there's still like around 600,000 people every year. Uh, mm-hmm. Not all of them go to court, but they get arrested, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, that's still happening, you know, and that's not, hasn't even gone down very much. Yeah, in California, we don't see that much anymore. Like, you know, like the cops lost interest because, you know, the the way they thought about it, when cannabis was a felony and you're getting felony arrest and felony convictions, that really looks good on your cop record. You know, like they have like little notches on the belt and, you know, felony notches are pretty awesome. But misdemeanor notches are kind of like not that impressive and it's not the way to become detective. And, you know, most ambitious cops, like they want to become detective. And so... um, that's why like most cops have, have just lost interest in cannabis and you know probable cause is no longer easy for them anyways because the odor of cannabis by itself is no longer probable cause to believe that there's a crime being committed unless it's smoke cannabis in a vehicle then that's like probable cause for a DUI but if you know it's just like unsmoked cannabis in a vehicle 
that's not a crime. And in the olden days, that was a crime. That was felony transportation of marijuana. And marijuana was still illegal. Right. At, you know, even transportation of less than an ounce was, you know, a misdemeanor. And it was still enough to support a search because it was probable cause. And so because of Prop 64, you know, like just cops have just generally lost interest in marijuana. The odor of cannabis is no longer probable cause. And, you know, it's, it's not like the easy way to start doing searches. And that means there's a lot less cases that end up in getting filed by the prosecutors. And so the cases that we see now are like people getting busted at the airport or like, you know, cultivation with any fish and game violations, um, anything involving minors, you know, anything involving out of state, anything, you know, shipping out of state, uh, those are, tend to be the cases that get filed. Huh, interesting. So it's a lot easier to be a kid getting high on the streets these days. Right, but it uh, seems like, you know, a lot of things that used to be handled, um, well, it's easier in some senses. I mean, it's, uh, there's still, co a lot of these things are being handled by code enforcement officers now. So essentially what used to um, be handled by sheriffs um, are now you'd get a notice that says, you know, abate this violation within X days or you got to pay us. And, you know, there might still be criminal penalties as, as well, but it's not, you know, necessarily, it's usually not at this point, at least in California, police officers that are coming out to do these types of inspections. It's been shifted over to more of a, a civil matter. If we're talking about things like cultivation. Now, if we're talking about, you know, shipping out of state, that's a, that's a different, you know, story. Um, but the smaller things are, for the most part, uh, if there's no other crimes, you know, you know, evidence of other crimes, and it's being handled in more of a civil fashion. But these penalties can be really high. And, um, you know, here in Sonoma County, there have been um, ones of several hundred thousand dollars. You know, it depends on what the the, the penalty, the violations, rather the alleged violations. Uh, at uh, or here in Sonoma County, is the me not um, really allowing uh, medical cannabis patients to take full advantage of uh, what the state allows. So under state law, if you're a medical cannabis patient, you are allowed to cultivate as much as your medical needs require. That's what state law says. Um, but it also says that you have follow your local restrictions. Um, and in Sonoma County, they limit medical cannabis patients to hundred square feet for their garden area. So under state law, maybe you could grow, the county says you can only do um, 100 square feet and we had to fight with them to even uh, essentially get them to acknowledge that um, and you know there's been instances of patients you know having their uh, what we believe having their rights violated and so we do want to um, continue to we continue to educate the county on things like this um, and and uh, it is important that that doesn't get uh, ignored while everyone is, you know, moving towards just focusing on this industry and uh, building things up. So um, it's, uh, I forgot how I got on that path. Oh, oh, uh, whether it's going to be, um, people are getting arrested. That's right. Um, so, so anyway, that's now handled usually by code enforcement matters. But even with code enforcement, we've seen them try to slap these really heavy penalties on folks who are it's not really doing anything wrong um, in, in, in my mind. And, and maybe they had, um, you know, exceeded their square footage that the county wanted by a few square feet, or they had seven plants instead of six. But again, they're under, they're a patient and under state law that would be allowed. And so fighting about things like this and, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, um, it is, you know, just want to make sure that folks are, I think it's wonderful that we can cultivate here in, in California as it should be. I mean, in my home state of New Jersey, they just passed a, a legalization law that won't let you grow at home. I think that's ridiculous. Huh. Um, and so, wow. you know, I think, I that's think home, crazy. yeah, it is. That's why it is in Illinois right next door to me. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, in California, we really fought for that homegrown thing. You know, Pebbles uh, Trippet is kind of one of the people who just pioneered that, and she wouldn't ever say no on that. And so it's been very important that it's it's part of the you know the right to farm, the right to grow your own food, the right to grow your own medicine, and those are sort of would you think would be sort of fundamental human rights that yeah. you know we're allowed to grow our own medicine and and do that. Uh, but uh, anyway, the powers of bees don't always agree on that. So. 
Uh, mm, and yeah, no, they think we're a bunch of witches. Yeah. Price yeah. of the almighty yeah. dollar. What do you think about the potential of this? Um, what? Brian, did you want to say something? I said that's the power of the almighty dollar. You used to be able to borrow yeah. and trade. Yeah. Now you have to have the dollar, yeah. you know? So it's not your service for a service. It's how much money can you give me for this, you know? So. Yeah, that's the old model. I think we're entering like the age of Aquarius, you know, and we're yeah. entering, I mean, like there's just like a, a energy shift that, uh, you know, I think a lot of people have been feeling lately. And those, uh, yeah. I think that, you know, the pandemic has really like caused like society to engage in self-examination, which never would have happened. You never would have had a lot of like, you know, industries like trying to rethink how things are done. And so <laughs> we, I believe we're in the midst of a huge change. And, um, you know, cannabis is really good at giving people the overview effect and the big picture and like a more global vision. And I do believe this herb is the healer of the nations and yes. you know there's still much more to be done on this cannabis journey yes Absolutely. amen amen well i hope they can at least um hopefully pass that thing saying that we can just uh cross the border into another state where it's recreational legal to do sales you know like between oh, california and oregon for example yeah um okay. you or know, even that, if that doesn't happen potential there's a, a big potential. And then before that could even happen, you know, I think we're going to start seeing a cannabis tourism once, you know, COVID <laughs> really like um, wanes because people are like really like want to go travel. Like, you know, everybody I know who likes to travel is like already planning all their future trips. And so California like again. gets a lot of like internal uh, tourists, like people from other parts of California will come up. And so I think we're gonna see people trying to rediscover California and that's gonna open up a lot of opportunities for you know, um, just local cannabis tourism, which I'm pretty excited about and just cannabis yeah. events and you know, just seeing everybody again, you know, everybody here, imagine like you know, when we can, Pat, we can all uh, share the, the, uh, the, the joints or even like share the same hookah, you know? I don't think anybody will ever blow right, out birthday right. candles, but you know, I do look forward to <laughs> sharing a hookah. Oh, 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 oh God, uh -huh. it's the end of the birthday candle business. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> God, yeah, that's invested. Uh, yeah. No, they'll have electric birthday candles and you just blow the switch or something like that. That's right. right. Yeah, you're know, right. Yeah, right? <laughs> well, that's fascinating. Well, the world is certainly a changing place right now, and it's it's actually exciting. You know, these are exciting times, even though we have to go through all of these hoops and being the pioneers, it's up to us to be yeah. able to do that. And, and it's really thanks to people like you, Lauren and Omar, that we are able to do this because we're just a bunch of farmers out here and we're not familiar with the law. And if it wasn't for people like you to help guide us, we'd all be shit out of luck, basically. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we really owe a lot to you guys to be helping us get through this transitional period yeah, into yeah. a legal status. And, and if you didn't legal. exist, we'd be bored out of our fucking minds working corporate law, you know? So thank you for, for yeah, being there. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's really hard to make a business plan or, you know, figure out how to do it when they just change the rules every six months or so on and so forth. And, you know, yeah. the, the thing with the California Environmental Quality Act is that once we set what we say we're going to do, if we change it, we supposedly going to have to do a whole nother quality act of review, you know? And so all this stuff is just, you know, so ridiculous. We've got to make it more simple. I think mm -hmm. that's really the key to simplify it. And because in the old days, it really was simple. You grew some good it's weed, you had a, a few plant. connections and, and you sold it, right? You right, know? right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. They should be selling them as house plants at Safeway, you know. <laughs> I mean, this is yeah, yeah. Right, right. Well, wow. but it's not easy to grow high grade cannabis, that's for sure. And people are welcome to grow it in their home, but there's something special about, you know, having the really perfect conditions. And you have to, over years, you dial in your property, you dial into the climate, you dial into the, the local, you know, other plants that are growing there, the seasons and so on. And it takes quite a while to really, you know, dial it in to figure out how you uh, really take advantage of, of your place. And, and then the, that's what we're talking about. Appalachian is one of the most key things 
because I, you know, thank you for saying that before. If, if it gets international approval, then and we get international trade, then you know, there's really just going to be because cannabis has always been international, mostly as hashish, but it's an international product, mm. and we all treasured that Afghani hash or the Bombay mm. Black or the Lebanese Blonde or stuff like that, the yeah. Acapulco Gold, all those things. We just, you know, treasured the the things that we used to smoke in the old days, and we'll be able to get them again, right? But now they'll be even better quality. That's what, the whole thing is rising up. And now we get the science too, right? The scientists are coming in. And every day I read, there's a new thing they figure cannabis is good for, right? And, and so it's just such an exciting time of you know, change and growth and so on. <clears throat> so uh, I would love to be able to get some Afghani hash. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> Ask and you shall receive. We have an appellation that you know you were no sure that there's because there have been times when I bought incense or shoe polish because I didn't you know I you know I I was a a black market deal in the side street or something like that you know but if you had a guarantee that this really was from guaranteed from Afghanistan from uh, you know what was it. uh, Kandahar up in there, yeah, or Mazar, uh, uh, Mazar Sharif, or uh, yeah, or Bamiyan up in there. So anyway, and weren't they stamped? Anyway, they had like a cool little like seal that was stamped on yeah. the hash. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we used to get Lebanese yeah, yeah. That, that had a stamp in it too. These bags like that for right. sure. It was good stuff. Uh, right. no. Yeah, candy was the best. <laughs> It'll be there again. No question. So. No so, question. Well, so does anyone else have any final comments or questions for these great people to share? Or anything out there? Ed, how you doing? Oh, Brian had his wave just hand. Brian Riddle, do I have an too there? Okay. Okay. Brian, I, you may have already covered it. I don't want to go ahead. But a question was um, if we applied for the medical card for each state. I believe they do give like tax breaks, but would also make a uh, would it make a difference for the community, the cannabis community, if we more people were registered medically with each state. Mm, I mean, mm. it's always better for you know. I guess registration can be expensive, and it doesn't give you the right for interstate commerce. So like, if you yeah. have you know cards for multiple states that doesn't really give you like the right to ship pounds of weed from one state to another. But if you're transporting your personal use amount, that's like a pretty you know reasonable explanation for why you would have cannabis across state lines if you have the official ID. But I think if you look at the frequently asked questions of most state programs, they will say something like, you know, you cannot take this out of state. It's only yeah. valid within the state. And so that's not going to be the solution. I think the solution is something like the MORE Act, which just deschedules cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act. And then you don't have to worry about like getting multiple state ID cards. Okay. But But there could be benefits, you know, to having the card, just legally speaking, right? If you're busted just for possession in that state and you have that state's medical card, depending on the state you're in, I mean, that could be the difference between it being a misdemeanor or felony or, you know, a, an infraction and misdemeanor, obviously, but, you know, that's something, um, you know, why there might be other reasons why you want it, right? But yes. I don't know um, if turns of overall and um, kind of like what, what Omar said, it doesn't give you a free pass to, to, to ship no. across state lines. Sadly. But would it give us like a, polit- like, for example, be able to give us a political power in the sense that we could say we have x amount of people that are willing to vote for this if you're willing to help give us this tax-free day or x y and z that's just a general question right patients are are some of the most persuasive uh constituencies when they go to the uh, politicians so you know it really does help Uh, but i think you don't need to have like the official state id card you could just have like you know anything issued by a doctor when you meet with your political, you know, representatives. And I think what people in the cannabis industry are now realizing is that, you know, if um, we don't become the leaders, the leaders don't know what they're doing. And so it's, it's better, you know, we've seen that with local permitting, we're seeing it with the state level, you know, that um, I encourage all of you on this call to, you know, think about running for some public office at some point in your life, because we need people like you. Joanna, that's irresponsible. <laughs> That's it, well, Joanna. Joanna for president. 
Huh? Oh, but <laughs> also, you can engage with your public officials by going to Board of Supervisors yes. meetings, City Council meetings. And you can, you know, write to your senators and Congress people and so on. And, you know, it, it is an exercise that's worth it, you know, and, and it gives you some sort of, you know, uh, you know, stake in the game in a sense also. I wanted to talk, Ed, also, I think there's also a reciprocity thing between states. So if you have a med card in one state, there's some states you can go to a regular medical place and buy it there and be totally cool. Okay. But it's a, you know, a state to state reciprocity a situation. It's not a blanket thing. So you'd have to check beforehand anyway. But that's only if you want to go to a re registered dispensary in another state and then you show your med card. But they might not deduct the tax. They might just say, oh, OK, you can buy it, but mm. whatever. But so it's best mm. to check every state if you're going to be traveling. Of course, we're not traveling now. But yeah. if you were going to go, make <laughs> sure you did. check the state laws <laughs> and do it. And uh, yeah. And I say, bring your own too, if you can, somehow with your med card. <laughs> right. Wonderful. So, Thank right. you, guys. Blessings. Thanks. Yeah. So yeah. any last words? Uh, Lauren, do you have a last little word of advice for people? Uh, Wilbur, or, Wilbur has oh, a question. wait, Wilbur had a question. What was that? It was more or less a statement. Up here in Maine, we had a, a moratorium where we all voted so everybody, and it got passed, so that every, every homeowner could have six plants and grow them at home. I have a medical card. I'm a disabled veteran with GI tract issues and a bunch of other things. So I got tired of taking medication and decided to grow my own hemp, uh, grow my own cannabis. Uh, I can grow six. Now the lobby's got in here. They've taken away the right to just everybody, even though everyone, you, it's, it's legal here in the state of Maine, but you only can have three plants at home now. And it's only three, three plants huh. per lot not family members, it's per lot. So if you have 108 lots, two people living on it in one house, you only can grow six plant, three plants on it. So they're taking away our rights. Wow. So I have a medical card. I can, I'm grandfathered, I can grow six. And uh, so I just wanted to let you know, it, 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 it is beneficial. Yeah. That's why, no, that's yeah. why they say eternal vigilance. You always have to Very be on them because they're always trying to take stuff away. Right. Yep. So you just have to be insistent and go and organize your fellow people and say, hey, no, this isn't enough. We need this medicine. And it, see, one of the ways we did it out here is it's like it's a medical thing. So a legislature is not qualified to give you a medical prescription by saying three plants. They've given you a medical prescription by saying you can't use more than that. And so you go after them the way I maybe, and then so you say, hey, listen, you aren't qualified to prescribe a medicine for me. Only my doctor can do that. And I have to grow it because I can't afford to buy it. And that's an angle, but you have to make it active politically to demand it. You have to go back and say, hey, yeah. And Omar? My thought would be to get a group of patients in Maine together and approach the state legislature. Uh, I don't know if you have initiatives in Maine. I don't think so, right? Do you have voter initiatives? Yeah. Oh, well, if you do. Yes, that's how it got passed in the first place as a voter initiative. And then our legislators decided to <clears throat> add rules to it because they knew more than we did. So mm. they did it all up basically for greed. Wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, in California, you know, to deal with Prop 64, we're probably going to have to need another voter initiative. Uh, because the only thing that could modify uh, the fundamental structure of Proposition 64 would just be a new initiative to wipe the slate clean. And that makes me think, you know, in a place like Maine, it's going to be the same thing where uh, the patients have to get together again. And maybe now with like the, um, you know, responsible adult use uh, advocates and advocate for an initiative that is better than the current system. I think, you know, when people like talk about uh, Prop 64 legalizing cannabis, it did not legalize cannabis. It basically uh, semi decriminalized it and it also commercialized aspects of the industry. And so that was just like the first baby step on the path to having legal uh, cannabis and really plant freedom. You know, there's like a whole bunch of plant allies in this universe that humanity has used for millennia. And we're in the process of rediscovering them. And, you know, it's what I think Terrence McKenna called part of the archaic revival, where there's like, you know, this renewed interest in these ancient wisdom and plant healing. And I feel like, you know, we're kind of, you um, 
you know, entering that new new time um, as like, you know, we have all this like really painful shocks through this present, but um, I, you know, everything that you're, you're saying, like, you know, keep the faith up in Maine and, you know, um, you, you can make it happen because all it takes is like a small group of thoughtful and committed people to change the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. But eternal vigilance. All right, I think yeah. we're going to uh, sign off now. If anybody has any last thing, Lauren, did you have a little message? James, did you have something? Oh, wait. Yeah, I was going to ask Omar more, more about the tourism, but I just want to say to Wilbur, I went to a great event up in Maine called the Community Bonfire in October, and they're doing another one in January. So if you don't already know about it, you should check it out. Awesome. Wow. And thank you. I, I, pretty much, I haven't left my house since March, really. I pretty much stay home. I'm compromised. And so I, you know. Okay. I understand. But yeah, <laughs> it's been going on for a long time. Yeah, I understand, making, so okay. <laughs> check okay. it out when you can. Okay. And, and, it, and about the tourism thing is a great thing. That's uh, Brian Applegarth is heading that up. And I'm yeah. so glad you're involved with that, Omar. That's a big deal. And yeah. We really hope to see that yeah. grow. Yeah, yeah. His very first tour was out to our ranch, I believe, right. a couple That's of years right. ago. So, yeah. uh, we're very connected with Brian. That is a thing where we destigmatize that way. And, you know, maybe it'll be like pick your own or something like that, uh, whatever, uh, at some point. Who knows, you know? Yeah. And we'll, we'll have little things where we'll uh, mimic the old days of renegade groves where you carry a bag of soil on your back, uh, crawling under the bushes out to your little grow uh, somewhere hidden out there. And, and you can recreate that. We'll have sound crack of helicopters flying off and, you know, it's like that sort of thing. and you can trim your own. I mean, that's sort of like an amusement park kind of thing where uh, we're, we're thinking about that already. So <laughs> anything can happen. Yeah. When you got a bunch of stoners cooking around, anything can happen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wow, well, just thank you so, so yeah, much really. to Lauren and thank Omar. You. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. And yeah hear your thoughts really and really thank uh, you so much for everything you do for our community yes, it's really thank you. really it's, uh, important really great so and thanks to all of you for it. being here yeah. yes so it's great to see you. all righty thank yeah you thanks Bye -bye. to zoom for cool shirt here. omar right. yeah oh thank, thank, thank you good to see you all oh my gosh happy holidays happy holidays nice to see you thank you much love to everyone good to see you